Okay, thank you for not running away. Um, this is another presentation, as you expected. Um, thank you, Leonora, for offering me this possibility. Uh, yeah, I will just uh, summarize uh, a part of my doctoral thesis to you. Um, yes, um, I present uh, I presented a poster about this. Um, thesis yesterday, so perhaps anyone had already seen it. Um, but let's start. Um, you can read here, form follows fingers. Some of you know uh, form follows function, but function is not my uh, speciality. Uh, this is about fingers and the fingers of the producer. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> to summarize uh, the uh, the project, um, the greater project, which is named uh, Limites inter provincias. Um, I research in a recently discovered uh, pottery complex in the Roman Vicus Cambraten, which is uh, here. This is the Lake of Zurich. This is Switzerland. And yeah, it's a uh, Vicus uh, from, the sec seven, uh, from, from the second century. Um, and in the last five uh, till ten years, um, the Vikings became more and more important. Several, several excavations uh, revealed a site with a representative forum, um, which is here. Um, um, prestigious mansions, an impressive sanctuary in the north, and uh, um, six pottery sites. My task is to investigate the economic situation in the second century on the basis of the northern pottery site, uh, which is right uh, at the head. It's called Flu. Um, and there were five kilns and really masses of shirts, about 30,000. Those shirts show regional and super-regional types, and they can be used as an indicator of different layers of a complex system of cultural areas and identities. Okay, for this task, I currently work on a type of, those are the five um, kilns, and this is the ceramic production of the area, and I have to work on a typology of the Vikers. There, already is a typology of regular Ackermann based on few material from the representative buildings near the forum. So I tried to fit my pots in and add some new types like we always uh, do it. But again and again, I had really great problems with the concepts of typology in general. It is not only the jungle of terminologies in Roman provincial archaeologies, which are alternately based on technique, appearance, surface, site, or researcher. It is also the question of what do we search when we make those pragmatic, pra pragmatic assortative typologies and seriations, no matter if they, um, how they were made or how, um, on what they are based on. I think it is a good method to deal with those masses of shirts, but um, the question is, isn't there more? Aren't there individuals and a recognizable hand or a workshop style influences different technical solutions, a different cultural behavior, different skill levels? Um, isn't there behind every pot a whole community, a whole mind, a social belonging, a whole world, perhaps? Um, and Yes, um, these are those existing typologies. And uh, um, while I'm working, I'm often thinking um, uh, about the much quoted example. Um, if you know everything about friction, wind resistance, instant speed, inclination, and more, you, are, you in spite do not have any clue about riding a bike. But it's the same. So where are we or where am I? I'm the one who try to know all those things about friction and speed, but not as implicit knowledge like the biker, 
but as explicit knowledge and sometimes uh, we forget about the motivation and the skill of the biker and perhaps the meaning of his personal style. There are a lot of um, exciting, inspiring and intelligent papers from ethnoarchaeologists, anthropologists, from the neurosciences or sociology. And um, I try to um, mix them with my work. But you know how it is when you try to deal with all those shirts in front of you on your desk. It's really difficult. And what should I do to make it right? I try to make it right, but how? And isn't it easier to do typologies as usual? So has theory led where practice could not follow? Then I tried something. First, um, I thought I will do all the typological stuff like it is done everywhere in Roman context and like it is expected from me. Um, then um, I'm doing the natural science stuff. This is the second uh, block. Um, that is to say the X-ray fluorescence uh, analysis to get a comparison group for Kempraten flu. This is the pottery site. And uh, this is still a new resource of further information in uh, Swiss Roman archaeology. And at the same time, I am working on something ethno-archaeological and on the basis of those inspiring sociological thoughts. Well, I will try. Um, each of these groups is based on a very different perception of the relationship between human and object. And I will see if it will lead to different results or different types or an alternative to typologies or types. I don't know. I just try. And that it will work or, or that there will be some results. I know because there are already some experiments for, um, for Bronze Age sites, for example, of Olivier Gosselin or Sebastien Manem, who had um, his oral presentation on Thursday. And like he said, operational automatisms will be hard to modify because of the routine nature fixed since childhood. The process of learning manufacturing techniques profoundly, profoundly affects the individual, implying a correlation of body and mind as observed in psychology and ethnology. So when this is possible for Bros age sites, um, and there is a cultural bodily identity, then um, I will be able to consider this for Roman, for Roman context. Um, in uh, the German and the Swiss archaeology, these um, methods are still um, are not used at the moment, and um, the pottery archaeology is um, still very traditional. And I think this is because the Roman pottery uh, does not have those obvious technical steps like in Bronze Age pottery, where you have the coiling and the beating and all those more, I think, more obvious steps in a production chain. The uh, Roman vessels are mostly wheel thrown, and this is a technique which suppresses many individual marks. But I think it's possible to uh, see those individual marks. Well, again, um, what should I do to make it right? In February, I presented some thoughts about process-related and intentional marks on wheel-thrown vessels after, uh, oh, sorry, after very long discussions with local potters. I try to get a kind of typology which reflects the perception of the producer. For example, um, can I have... Uh, no? Or can I? No. Okay, you see the very light channel in the first uh, vessel? It's a bowl, and there's a very light 
uh, channel at the rim. And this channel, channel for example, is not um, a special step. It just arises when you bring up the clay with a special tool. But it is an intended step to remove it. So the second vessel has, um, in this part of the production chain, two steps, and the first one just one. Uh, so normally you, you would think uh, the first one is the more complex vessel. But, well, it's not. And this is just one example. I will skip the other example because I don't have so much time. Um, it's just to express how important this decision between intended and um, process-related marks is. Or I think so, that it is. Okay, I wanted to make a broader experiment to distinguish also cultural traditions or a workshop style or the individual hand of a producer. And I asked the renowned School of Ceramics in Landshut, this is Bavaria, for cooperation. For one week, I went there into the school for pottery apprentices. And there I was allowed to observe the teaching methods as well as, well as the development of the trainees. I documented the attitudes of teachers and pupils, and I was allowed, allowed to make special experiments. First of all, um, I focused on the behavior regarding the handling with ancient Roman shirts I had with me. I showed the shirts to teachers and three classes of skill levels. And I just will um, tell you some observed points they, uh, which were striking, I think. The first one is uh, there was a total ignorance of my cross-section drawings during, um, on the displayed shirts. Nobody, nobody touched my cross-section drawings. Then, second, um, there was an intensive touching of the shirts. There was scratching and knocking them against the table. Um, I tried not to influence the atmosphere, and uh, but I feared that someone tried to bit off a piece. Uh, it was very intensive touching. And there was one situation, which I think was striking. Um, someone touched a shirt and he said, look, and passed this shirt to someone else. And this one touched it again and said, ah, right. So w which information did I miss here? And I think there it is. There's the nonverbal knowledge, the intangible world behind the object. There's a very different perspective of the crafts person and the other crafts person. They had a language I couldn't even hear because it's nonverbal. Well, the third point is um, the focus of five questions they asked me or each other. Um, the first one was, what is the vessel for? This was always the first question. Then, what clay do you need? Or uh, what does the clay has to be able for? And Will it need high or low skill to produce this vessel? Can we give it to an, an apprentice? And how many pieces could you do in one hour? And the last uh, question was, um, how hot was it burned? So these are not my questions. Um, when I uh, see um, a shirt at the first moment, I, I have other questions in, in mind, like, what type is it and what uh, is the date of the, yeah, you know. Um, the f uh, next point is that none of the teachers uh, or pupils were interested in the profile of the vessels as archaeologists are trained for. It was really the, the overall impression which was important. And they asked me about the bottoms of the vessels because I only brought, brought rims, like we do it. And for them, the bottoms were really important because this showed, showed them the, uh, the finishing and more steps in, uh, at the end of a production chain. 
Mm, okay, I will leave it at this description and I have still to think about those days. I made a second experiment and this was the reproduction of a Roman bowl as we find them in many Roman provincial sites as a relic of late Latin traditions. You can see the original bowl here. Um, this type shows a broad range of variation in contrast to other more standardized Roman bowls. And I wanted to know why. First, I learned that this is a form for apprentices. What would explain it? So a class of trainees had to cop copy it for me. One half of the group who had to do this for a school examination, so this was a very serious situation for them, um, this half was in instructed to touch the bowl intensively and the other group was just allowed to look at it. I have to admit that the time of perceptions the pupils needed was surprisingly short. And they just used their hands mostly for measurements. All of them know exactly what uh, the dimensions of their hands. And you can see this here and there, how they um, just measured the bowl. Mm, after one minute of looking and touching, they run at their desks and made one bowl after another. In one hour, they produced between five and seven pieces, and they told me a master would do about 12. I watched another throwing examination uh, with a jug for a model. And here, after the throwing, they cut the jugs in halves for valuation. So remember that nobody touched my cross-section drawings, <laughs> but if they are still in learning process, they used it um, as a checkup for measures. And as soon as their um, hands know what to do, their mind is free and a cross-section would transfer far too little information. These are the results and uh, of the first experiment and the Roman original down here. You see there is a, a wide range of variations, although it was an examination and they tried very hard to copy it exactly and right. But uh, they are still apprentices and their body memory is not completely developed yet. I also docu documented the use of tools and a lot of details like posture and facial expression. And I'm still analyzing this surprising week and another week. So I cannot give you all the results yet. yet. I got a list from the teacher, teachers, um, which is giving me a hint of the skill of each pupil. So I can correlate my own estimation with theirs. And uh, it is interesting how the series differ among each other pupil. So this is one pupil, this is another, and another, and another. Um, um, and how homogeneously or heterogeneously they are within themselves in one series. The most important I learned in this week was how big this gap is between the producer's perspective and our academic perception of an object and perhaps why it exists. It was described before by some researchers, this um, gap between the perceptions. And I think I can uh, show it to you here um, in the graphics. Um, here you got the object and then you get a first abstraction when the informant, the producer or uh, a craftsperson is forced to verbalize a non-verbal proce process. And what the archaeologist understands here um, is the first reduction because the listening archaeologist is not even an apprentice of the craft. And what the archaeologist writes is the second abstraction because he has got to verbalize it again. And there is what the reader of the archaeological paper understands. So between the first object and um, the last description of information, 
there could be a really broad gap. And it gets worse uh, when it is about an archaeological object and the informants are dead. So it is, I think it is essential to do this ethno-archaeological studies to bridge this gap and um, perhaps uh, make this um, distance smaller, even if it's Roman stuff and it's all very standardized. I think it's possible to um, mix those two kinds of perception, because a perception can never be wrong. They're just different kinds of perception. And we can broaden ours when we mix it up with um, the perspective of the producer. Okay, thank you very much. Don't listen.